Welcome and listeners, it's time for episode 110 of the Slump Buster Podcast. I'm your host, Juju Talk Sports. Join me as Kyle Ledbetter on today's episode. We talk the Giants' late loss on Thursday to Washington, some University of Southern California coaching candidates, and preview NFL Week 2. But before we do that, folks, it's time to give a shout out to our partner. Caveman Coffee Co. Caveman is a fantastic single source, single origin goodness from a company with impeccable taste and ethics. The people behind it are beautiful souls, and the coffee is delicious fuel for the never-ending quest to do better, be better, love harder, and enjoy deeper. Guys, I tell you, their nitro cold brew is the perfect blend of energy and refreshment in the morning. Great way to start the day. But why stop there? They have their mammoth blends, which I highly encourage you getting. They have their hibiscus teas, which are delicious. And guys, if you use our promo code slump, you get 15% off your next purchase of any of these fantastic products. Kmancoffeeco.com, promo code slump. Guys, don't be a chump. Use promo code slump and get yourself a case today. All right, y'all. Juju Talk Sports, Kyle Ledbetter, episode 110. Let's get it. Let's bust the slump and let's enjoy. a Thursday night game last night to break down isn't that the most Giants way to lose a game possible that whole game just felt like the most Giants and Washington game in the world like it was close both teams are evenly matched and we kind of thought that at the start of the year but the the one takeaway I took coming out of that game is that neither team is going to make the playoffs the Giants or Washington is not going to the playoffs this year Washington's offense was Alex Smithian again this last game which was basically just every pass going four yards in the air Maybe they'll get one or two big plays to Terry McLaurin, who now I saw the stat is now on his 10th quarterback in 30 games as an NFL starting wide receiver. So for the Giants, it's always fun. We we have beef with Giants fans, which is basically just I start beef with teams that I know I'm going to end up being right on. So it's always fun to see the Giants collapse like that. I predicted in the preseason, the Giants go with three wins this year, and they have not let me down with that 0-2 start. I know you like some fun stats and everything. So one that I saw populating on NFL memes, of course, was the Giants are 18 and 48 since their legendary boat photo. The worst record in football, 0-2 in their last five seasons. Haven't had a winning record in a season since 2017. This team is just the epitome of bad and the... uh... Looks like we got some guest stars over there. We've got a guest sneaking around back here. (laughs) Yeah, he's going to help me pick games later, I think. (laughs) But I saw that on the camera. That's so funny. Didn't seem too enthused to be on camera. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh, that was fantastic. A great way to start the podcast, huh? Guest stars, animal interference moments. Uh, We actually did a reaction a couple weeks ago. Best animal interference moments in sports. Giants just haven't been the same since that black cat ran on the field, have they? That's what I was thinking. They had that moment. They had the boat photo, which is obviously legendary now. Because even people forget after the boat photo, they lost by like 30 points to the Green Bay Packers. And so all of a sudden now, the Giants find themselves... I guess a decade removed from that Super Bowl, and it's just been perpetually mediocre for the Giants. And uh, I don't think Dave Gettleman's going to last. The latest example of this being that Dave Gettleman traded down for the first time in his 55 picks as Giants and Panthers general manager. He got rid of Justin Fields and acquired Kadarius Toney, who now has negative two receiving yards in his first two games as an NFL starter. I loved how on the page you had to point out that uh, I have technically more receiving yards. You have technically more receiving yards than Kadarius Tony on the year. So we're all doing pretty well for ourselves out here, except if your name is Kadarius Tony. Or Dave Gettleman or Joe Judge or Daniel Jones or Saquon Barkley. Really just anyone who is uh, affiliated and or around the New York Giants organization. I jumped the gun on that meme, though, uh, last night. I was expecting Daniel Jones to make a turnover and usually expecting Daniel Jones to have a turnover in a game is a pretty sure bet but took the L so I, I think it's still a wash I, I, I'll consider that still a win in the books even though didn't technically turn the ball over in the game not only that but Daniel Jones also had the best play of his career where he finally didn't trip on his way to the end zone on an 80 yard run and they called it back because of a hold and it was a rough night to be Daniel Jones I think Daniel Jones is officially now the new Trubisky he's not that bad but because of where he was drafted because of the name recognition around it Giants fans are just kind of over him at this point so blessing in disguise is that if you miss the playoffs this year you can finally clear 
nuclear house and fire Gettleman and fire Joe Judge and fire, well, I guess just get rid of Daniel Jones at this point. I guess the bright side here is during that draft, I remember when everyone was like, oh, I can't believe you drafted Jones at six when you had Haskins at 15. Well, at least for the Giants sake, Haskins was just as bad, but it would probably been even more of a blessing to have had Haskins because at least he was easier to cut. Yeah. Haskins was at least set up to fail. The Giants at least tried their best. It's just that Dave Gettleman has been literally the worst drafter I've ever seen in, in the NFL draft. We just made a, a list of his terrible picks and he took Saquon over Denzel Ward, Josh Allen, Bradley Chubb, and Quentin Nelson. He took Daniel Jones at number six, which was the best he could do, but Daniel Jones was not a franchise quarterback. Then he took Andrew Thomas in 2020 over not only Justin Herbert, but just at the left tackle position, Jedrick Wills, Makai Becton, and Tristan Wirth. And then this year, Kadarius Toney. He also traded up into the first round to draft DeAndre Baker. That didn't work. He then traded Odell Beckham for a first round pick and Jabril Peppers. That first round pick was the now man of infamy as of today, Dexter Lawrence. And it's been genuinely awful to see how this has gone for the New York Giants. I thought the Giants actually won when Taylor Heineke had that late pick too. I, I think that's just the ultimate turn of events to really show how sorry the Giants have been is they have a late pick that sets them up perfectly in field goal territory and Saquon can't even run out the clock too. I don't know if it's a matter of the injury, if he's looking a little bit slow, but that's two games if you're a Saquon fantasy owner where you are definitely hating yourself today with the end result there. Uh, I didn't even see what Saquon's final stat line was, but I can't imagine that it was too becoming considering that the Saquon owner in one of my home leagues here uh, was definitely very vocal in the group chat last night. So Saquon Barkley finished yesterday as the <laughs> second leading rusher on the Giants behind Daniel Jones. He had 13 carries for 57 yards, although one of those carries was for 41 yards. So if you take that out, he had 12 carries for 16 yards outside of the one big rush that he had. 12 for 16 yards is unbelievably terrible. Yeah, that's a little bit more than a yard per carry. What is that, like maybe 1 like 1.3, 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1.4. It's really bad. And the Giants might have the worst offensive line in football. I think that's not a stretch to say it's a possibility. Man, even when Gettleman's making bad picks, he's also signing Nate Solder to big extensions. He drafted Will Hernandez, which hasn't really worked out. It's been really bad for the Giants over the past few years. <laughs> I don't see a turnaround coming soon. Like you said, at least that's an opportunity for them just to blow it up, clear house, look for a new quarterback, look for a new GM, look for a new coach. Speaking of looking for new coaches, uh, you actually did a video for us this week on the USC coaching job. What did you think of Clay Helton officially gain can, especially after two games? I haven't seen anything like that quite in some time. Yeah, especially at a premier program like USC, which is funny because on the Take It Easy podcast on Sunday after Oregon whooped up on Ohio State, I talked about how Oregon and USC are really the only two schools west of, let's say, Texas to have the resources to compete in college football at this point, or at least the willingness to put resources into their programs. USC, it's Los Angeles, it's 12 million people, it's Pac-12, large alumni base. For Oregon, it's all that Nike money that is flooding into that program. And so those are the two places that just have more money than the rest of the competition, which leads to the rest of the Pac-12, as I've been joking for about five to six years, just beating each other up over and over and over again so that everyone can be mediocre and nobody can ever make the college football playoff. And so you've got those two powerhouses and you've got everybody else hanging out down below. And for USC, this is an interesting coaching job because of those resources. And Helton, I, I love um, the shutdown full cast. Spencer Hall made a great joke where he said that they've basically hired Lane Kiffin three times now. They hired Lane Kiffin, they hired Steve Sarkeesian, and then they hired Clay Helton. So they basically just hired Lane Kiffin three in a row. They'll probably go somewhere else this time around. And they're probably going to end up with one of these like coaches at smaller programs that goes to USC, maybe a Matt Campbell, a James Franklin. Although I think James Franklin's trying to leverage this into an extension at Penn State, maybe Bill O'Brien comes over. He's the Alabama offensive coordinator right now. But for the point about USC, they were just waiting for him to lose the Stanford game. 
<laughs> they've been waiting like three years for him to lose that game so that they could fire him. He last year, they had like five wins in a row that were all seven plus point comebacks. And they just couldn't fire him after that season because they won the Pac-12 South. I think now that they're out of contention for the Pac-12 title without beating UCLA and running the table the rest of the season, I think this is a bit of a punt. Uh, The conspiratorial reason that I think they did this early is because players can transfer still. You can play four games and still transfer in college football. So players can leave now knowing that Clay Helton is there. Doesn't work out too well for USC, but it does work out better for these kids who maybe want to go play for different schools while they leave the program in limbo over at USC. I'm going to do a quick exercise with you here. So Vegas, of course, has released their odds for this open position. I want you to just real quick go down with a, a grade for each coaching candidate for the USC position. So Luke Fickle, the Cincinnati head coach, currently is at plus 600. So he is the heavy favorite right now for this position. What grade would you give Luke Fickle if USC could get him? That's an A. Luke Fickle's the guy. He's decided that instead of being like an interim coach at one of these other programs, like uh, what PJ Fleck did after his dominance at Western Michigan, he went to Minnesota and then he was in the running for the Oregon job. Fickle's just decided I'm going to stay at Cincinnati and wait for the major college program to call or maybe an NFL job, but I don't know if an NFL job would be in his window, but whoever gets Luke Fickle, that's an A higher, at least for now. Not that it's going to be successful, but you're not going to find many candidates better than Luke Fickle. It'd be interesting to see if he left that program ready for success as they entered the Big 12, stepping up obviously in competition there. James Franklin is the second favorite, actually tied with Luke Fickle at plus 600. Uh, Obviously Penn State, big game against Auburn. He tried to deflect this weekend as well before the game when asked about that question. James Franklin, uh, what's the grade there? I'd give it a minus, which is just to say slightly less than Luke Fickle, because this feels like a classic case of James Franklin is trying to leverage Penn State because there were reports last year after Penn State lost to Indiana that, you know, they were unhappy with what was going on with Franklin and that they were trying to look at his buyout terms and see if it was possible to move on, which that would have been dumb by Penn State to do. You're not going to find many coaches better than James Franklin. So this one feels like a classic trying to get a contract extension from the place you already are at by throwing your name into the mix. I know um, Cristobal at Oregon did that with the Auburn job last year where he wasn't really interested, but he kind of just like put his name in the mix. So, and then Oregon gave him a five-year contract extension. So I'd say A minus if they do hire James Franklin. Okay, at plus 700. So the last person to lead a Pac-12 school to the college football playoff, currently in retirement with the media, obviously did a fantastic job with the Boise State program. Chris Peterson at plus 700. What's the grade there? Man, I hadn't even thought about him until now. I guess I just thought he was like retired and he was going to do the Bob Stoops thing where he just kind of like commentates games and hangs out at his giant home up in the Pacific Northwest. It was the conference. So I think that that in itself is a great advantage there. Absolutely. I, I think Peterson's a great coach. I'd give it also an A minus, I'd say. I don't feel like that's settling if you get Chris Peterson. That doesn't feel like a a settling hire. Like what your Longhorns did. They tried to get Urban Meyer and they settled on Steve Sarkeesian. I feel like Chris Peterson's still pretty good. Boy, does it feel like we settled after that Arkansas loss. You mentioned his name, actually, funny enough, but plus 800, they have Bob Stoops. The last time we saw him, he was coaching an XFL team. Uh, Bob Stoops, if he went to USC, does that feel like a good fit? Kind of seems a little out place. It kind of seems like more of a Midwest guy. Doesn't seem like the type of guy that USC would pursue, but what's the grade? I had just kind of assumed that we had just let Bob Stoops like no longer coach because he kind of got aged out in college football. Like the reason Bob Stoops retired was because Oklahoma really wanted to hire Lincoln Riley and they couldn't fire him officially, but they kind of like made the transition amicable for both sides. And so I just assumed we weren't hiring Bob Stoops anymore. Kiss a B. You could do worse. You could hire Mark Stoops, his brother. He's the coach at Kentucky right now. Like that would be a settling type of hire, but I don't know. Bob Stoops is all right, I guess. <laughs> Rounding out the top five here. So Matt Campbell is plus 1,000. So Iowa State, uh, that program has been within the top 10 this year, obviously. And obviously coming off a huge loss to Iowa. <laughs> they lost by a good double digit margin to Iowa in the uh, the Cyhawk battle. 
coming off of last year, they won. I love this so much. They won their first New Year's Six Bowl game since 1950. Never. They have never, ever won a New Year's Bowl game until last year. And uh, they all stayed together. And now it's not looking too good for Iowa. It's looking like a trip to the Valero Alamo Bowl this year. Well, can Matt Campbell lead the USC Trojans to a Rose Bowl, I guess is the question. Uh, What's the grade there? I'd say A. I love Matt Campbell. I was so sad that he turned down the Lions job. Happy that it went to Man Campbell because Man Campbell is great for content. But Matt Campbell turned down like $58 million to coach the Lions. And I was really sad about that because I thought that would have been a perfect fit. He's always been connected to Ohio State. I don't think Ryan Day's job is in jeopardy anytime soon. So I don't think he can wait that out long enough to get the Ohio State job. I think it'd be a great hire by USC. I actually like him as much as I like like Luke Fickle as a hire. I think those are probably the two coaches that if you want a program builder, those are probably the two to take. Okay, we won't go down the entire list of the top 10, but I will touch on names that you have mentioned during this conversation. Bill Bryan at plus 1100. I would be unopposed to that. I don't know. It's just the Alabama thing. He's had success at both levels. Could work out well. B plus. B plus. Okay. And then I believe you mentioned Tony Allied in your video. He is currently at plus 2000. Yeah, that would be probably a, a B as well. Tony Elliott has pretty much turned down every coaching offer he's had so far. Same thing with Brett Venables. Brett Venables is always just hanging out here at this point. So like if Brett Venables does become available for a job, that's always the A plus higher because he's turned down like really good jobs over the years. Like I know he turned, we know he turned down Missouri. We're almost certain he turned down Auburn. He's turned down a lot of good jobs over the years. So if he does show interest in your program, Brett Venables is the A. Tony Elliott's about a B. I think he's someone who's going to get his own program whenever he wants it. Something I found extremely funny this week, I was listening to the Doug Gottlieb show and he had Mario Cristobal on. First question at the gate, he asked Mario Cristobal about the USC job. And you could tell like Cristobal was ready to just hang up the phone and like just end the interview right there. He's like, I thought we were on here to talk about the Ohio State win and you're bringing on me here to talk about the USC coaching job. It's like, what is this? I know USC is a big time program, but if you're at Oregon, that kind of feels like somewhat of an equal based off the national brand recognition that Oregon has become. Uh, Over the last decade, they've been way more recognizable than USC. I think there's only one job Cristobal would leave Oregon for, and it's the University of Miami. But even that might not be a better job than Oregon at this point. So there's not much you can do that would be different than Oregon at this point. Like if one of the major programs opens up, like Georgia, Ohio State, Oklahoma, I think those would be the jobs Cristobal would take. Or maybe he wants to go to the NFL, but I think I think he's going to be the Oregon coach for at least the next three to four years. All right, Slump Buster. So we're changing up the format here as we look at NFL Week 2. Last week, obviously, we went through all 16 games on the schedule. But we know your time is valuable, and we want to be as efficient and enjoyable of a podcast as possible. So on this week, we're just going to go through five games that we highlighted, five games that we believe strongly in. Heading into this week, though... I just have to do a little bit of bragging as not the prettiest record in the world, but I finished nine and seven on the week last week. Whereas my co-host here, Kyle Ledbetter, eight and eight mid tier. What are you? The Steelers, the bears nine and seven is the Titans eight and eight, I guess makes me Washington, right? I think Washington's kind of eight and eight at this point, Uh, technically seven and nine, right? But you would still make the playoffs. Whereas I'd still be on the outside looking in if I'm like that Steelers range. Yeah, I'd say eight and eight was about what I thought. Against the spread, we went three and two in the uh, take it easy pick em pool, though. So thank you to uh, Zach Wilson for backdoor covering on the Panthers last week. That saved me big time. <laughs> well, I, I think some of the better ones for me was getting lucky on the Cincinnati overtime victory there. And then, of course, we had some back and forth on the Eagles versus the Falcons. And that one just happened to work out for me uh, in a big way. Obviously, the Falcons show no signs of life in their opening weekend. Juju, let me ask you yeah. right now, how many players can you name on the Falcons defense? On the Falcons defense? Ooh, that is, uh, I know they're a linebacker. They have the guy that starts with O, and I only know that because I'm in a few IDP fantasy leagues. Uh, obviously, Keanu Neal's son with the Cowboys. So 
the Clemson cornerback that they drafted a couple years ago. I, I'm spacing on the name. Basically, no one. I, I can't think of anyone that I really comes to mind because I know they've gotten a rid of a lot of guys in the last couple of years. I, I don't even know. Is Grady Jarrett still with that team? He is technically still there. But if you threw out Tack McKinley, he would not be there anymore. But yeah, Grady Tack's Jarrett with is the Browns, there. right? I think so. He's either the Browns or the Chiefs, one of the two. But yeah, I think uh, Dante Fowler is still collecting paychecks there. He got that big contract from that one year with the Rams. I think he's still collecting paychecks from the Falcons. But after that, there's not that many. There's an SDSU guy there. I forgot which one it is, but <laughs> I don't I don't really. The Falcons defense is really bad. Yeah, maybe actually, who knows? I, I know the Cowboys defense looked just as bad, but maybe just Dan Quinn didn't have much to work with. But then again, Dan Quinn also drafted these guys. So it's kind of a give and take there. AJ no, Terrell, love, right? There we yes. go. That's a name. AJ Terrell. You came around and got it. How about that? <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> yeah. To the point on Dan Quinn, I love that the Cowboys strategy was, what if we took everyone from the worst secondary in the NFL and started them on our team? Let's bring in Keanu Neal. Let's bring in Demonte Casey. We're going to sign Malik Hooker. What if we just take the worst secondaries in the NFL and just put them on our team? <laughs> You know, it might be a little bit out of order here. We're going to start with the morning games first, but I think that's a good enough transition to go into the Cowboys versus the Chargers. So the Cowboys are going to be in LA this week. Uh, The Chargers are three and a half point home favorites in SoFi, even though I think this might be a Cowboys home game. If I'm being honest here, I think we're going to see a lot of Cowboys fans in Los Angeles this weekend. Uh, Drew and I were talking about this. Honestly, football team wise, where do the Chargers rank in LA? Well, USC's down right now. UCLA beat LSU. I'll give them credit. I thought they were going to be pretty average this season, but they, they look to be pretty good right now. So you said the Raiders might actually have more fans in LA. That's true. The Vikings drew a massive draw against the Chargers a couple of years ago. So maybe the Vikings have more fans. The Eagles have more fans. Uh, I know the Niners, there's a lot of uh, Northern California to Southern California transfers there. Niners are a good one for sure. With the Cardinals. The Rams coming yeah, off the Super Bowl. Rams are there. Ch- Chargers are probably somewhere outside the top 10, I would bet. Wow. Pretty sad for a NFL team. But bright side, Justin Herbert, lots of stars, lots of talent. They're starting off 1-0. So they have a chance to reclaim some of the fans out there if they happen to win and do well this season. Who knows? Maybe they could turn things around in L.A. Uh, Going into this game, so some important headlines. Demarcus Lawrence out six to eight weeks, broken foot. Randy Gregory may miss this game due to COVID. Justin Herbert had a great game against Washington, 300 yards. You have a pick, had a touchdown, uh, but you're going against one of the better defenses in the league. So I think it was a pretty successful day. Lyle Collins out five games on a suspension. They do get Zach Martin back off the COVID list as well. If you're the Cowboys, their offensive line gets a little bit more fortified. You know, a crazy stat. I, I just want to throw out a crazy stat when I was doing my research here. Did you know the Cowboys have not won a game since 2018 in which they haven't scored 30 points. So they have to score 30 points to win. That is the only way they win football games. Can they hit that number against the Chargers? I think they can hit 30 points in any game they choose at this point during the season. So after the 28 to three Falcons loss, it basically just concluded that the next four years of Falcons football were basically the same. It was Matt Ryan is going to throw 350 yards, three touchdowns, one interception, both teams are going to score in the 30s. You can flip a coin on who's going to win when it's a, when it's one of these like 30-30 shootout games. You can flip a coin on who's going to win. They're going to finish 8-8. Eight and eight. I think over three years after the Super Bowl they lost, the Falcons were 24-24 and 24, while having a similar type thing where they didn't win a game by scoring less than 30 points. The Cowboys are the new Falcons. The Cowboys are just, we're going to go 8-8 eight and eight just by scoring more points than everyone else and not playing defense. And so both teams are going to score in the 30s. I don't know what the over under is right now, but I would bet the over no matter what on this game. And I think that they can get some yards against a weaker Chargers secondary. And that's the part that concerns me is that the Chargers have tried to do their best. They drafted Asante Samuel Jr. this last year to try and address that situation and plugging it with like a Chris Harris every now and then. But I think that that Amari Cooper, CD Lamb could both again have over 100 yards like they did against the Buccaneers. And this game could end up being both teams over in the 30s. Yeah, so the over under is 55. 
drive. So I could very well see that one being over. I mean, Chargers are able to put up, I imagine they put up over 30 because I don't see anyone on this Cowboys defense being able to stop what they do offensively. They didn't generate any pass rush last week. They only had three quarterback hits on Brady, zero sacks. I know it's Brady, quick release, everything that we know of him over the years. But even with that said, no pass rush last week and no Demarcus Lawrence and Randy Gregory this week. How are they even going to get to Justin Herbert? Not to mention the Chargers, their offensive line in their first kind of game together. They seem to mesh pretty well. They kept Herbert pretty clean, two sacks allowed against that fearsome Washington front seven. I think that's a positive sign for them. The biggest things I, I think for the Chargers is they were pretty gash against the run game against Washington. Antonio Gibson did a great job on them. Can the Cowboys get Zeke involved? Can the Cowboys be balanced? Because if they're able to do that, I give them a little bit more chance in this game. Right now, I'm picking the Chargers. I am going with LA to win this game. But if the Cowboys could be a little bit more balanced this week, as opposed to just throwing 60 times with Dak like last week, I, I think that that's more so their path to victory. Um, especially, too, because you mentioned it, the Chargers secondary is kind of pieced together. But I, I think that they're a lot better than what the secondary was for the Bucks last week. I, I think that Derwin James out there certainly is a problem. And he will be very involved in coverage there to kind of take away from that prolific Cowboys passing game. My pick for the week is the Dallas Cowboys. Look at I like you with Dallas props. To win. Look at me preparing props like I didn't have that set up before the game. Look who did the research there. So yes, I like the Cowboys to win this week. At the bare minimum, they'll cover the four-point spread. This is one of those that's going to probably come down to the wire. Uh, both teams in the 30s, you can flip a coin on this one. And I like my chances with the Dallas Cowboys. Okay, so we started off in the afternoon slate. Let's head back to the morning. Let's talk about a team going from the West Coast to the East Coast. Always a fun scheduling thing when it happens very early in the year but even more fun if you're the Raiders you get to do it on the short week they're currently six point underdogs against the Steelers on the road these type of games have never favored the Raiders and certainly like I mentioned on fewer days to prepare a couple main things from their game coming off the, with the Ravens so obviously fantastic game one of the best Monday night football games I have seen on par with that Browns Ravens game that we got last year they lost one of their offensive linemen though in the game out for the year Gerald McCoy out for the year and I, I, I think, think Marcus those... Mariota's gone too. I know they just used him like one time, but I think he's out for a while. Yeah, and Gawkway, apparently he can possibly miss, which would be a shame because one of the best things that the Raiders did in that game was their pass rush. And Gawkway, Crosby, Nasib, they were all getting to Lamar Jackson. And against a less mobile quarterback in Big Ben, you would like to have your pass rush at full strength. And if Ngakwe misses that, that's a huge hit to their defense right there. Already, like I mentioned, losing Gerald McCoy, you lose that pressure up the middle. The Steelers... <laughs> Starting off 1-0 was one of the surprises of the weekend. Obviously, not a lot of people were picking them to beat the Buffalo Bills. Everyone is thinking, Josh Allen, Buffalo, they're just going to roll into town and kick their ass. Uh, no, not so much. Uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers defense came out to play. They looked strong. It wasn't the best game offensively for them. Uh, they were pretty much outpaced in all major offensive categories by Buffalo, but they were able to do just enough. They played better in the third quarter, fourth quarter, and that was enough to get it done against the Bills, Raiders, Steelers. Kyle, what's your pick? My pick for the game is going to be the obvious one, unfortunately. I do have Pittsburgh winning this week against the Raiders. How good was Pittsburgh's defense last week? I mean, good Lord, that was a performance to reestablish that the Steelers are pretty good. Like I had said in the preseason, the Steelers are going to be better than people think they're going to be, even if the Browns and Ravens also look very strong so far. That Raiders game, I mean, we can talk a little bit about Monday Night Football. That Raiders game was like every single thing that happened felt like it was just more and more ridiculous as it was going along. I don't think anyone walked away from that saying the Raiders are a legit great team now. I don't think anyone was saying that. I think everyone said this is a weird fluky win for the Raiders. They'll probably lose this game to the Steelers. Whether they cover the spread, that's a question. I would take Pittsburgh with the points in this one. My bit of analysis that I will go out on a limb on as saying is that this will be the breakout moment for Najee Harris. Najee Harris is going to have a huge fantasy football day. Buy him on your DFS teams. Hopefully start him if you have him on your fantasy teams. He got taken one 
one pick before me in our league, and I was so sad about that. Uh, like you mentioned, Gerald McCoy, Yannick Ngakwe are questionable. I, I know McCoy's out, but Ngakwe might not play. Cleland Furl and Max Crosby have been really inconsistent across the years, and I don't know if that's going to change or not. I know Furl didn't have the greatest game against the Baltimore Ravens, but obviously Crosby and Ngakwe and Nazib were great pass rushing for the Raiders. So I think this is a moment where Najee Harris breaks a big play somewhere in here, has, you know, 25 touches and, and has a big game for the Steelers. So no surprises here. This is this is going to be a Pittsburgh win, but it's a really interesting game just because both these teams are surprising 1-0 and teams that now happen to play each other in week two. I think what's going to be very hard for the Raiders is the Steelers front does a great job against running back. So I think Josh Jacobs, Kenny and Drake not being able to develop a running game is going to be really hard for play action. I think that they have better guys to cover Darren Waller and make it hard to have Derek Carr have his security blanket. Obviously, that monster on the other side, TJ Watt, he was a problem for Buffalo last week, two sacks on them. And I don't know who on the offensive line is going to be able to handle him because even Baltimore was able to get somewhat of a pass rush going against the Raiders last week. Now, they had to send more blitzes and everything to make it happen. The Steelers can get home with just four, and I I think that that's going to be one of the bigger differences. Plus, they'll do a little bit better job in coverage than the Ravens were able to do last week. A lot of broken coverages, a lot of, like you mentioned, fluky stuff. And the Raiders, they're a team that don't handle their emotions well. So coming off a big emotional, gritty victory like that, I I know it's very cliche to say it, but I I think that this is a team that's always due for a letdown game coming off that type of victory. So yeah, the Steelers, and I I think I'm comfortable even doing it with the points as well. I I think the Steelers will cover. I will say though, the last time that the Raiders played the Steelers was during their tanking season in 2018, where they won a meaningless game at home against Pittsburgh to get to three and 10. The Raiders are the kings of these random, like wacky upsets against great teams. They did it to the Chiefs last year. So that win actually in hindsight we now know that prevented them from drafting Nick Bosa with the number two pick in the draft. So this is uh, a difficult situation for the Raiders. They're not tanking anymore, but they're also not as good as we think they are. But they upset the Steelers the last time they played when they were double-digit underdogs. So maybe they've got something in the books here this week. One thing that former co-host uh, Andre Wynn likes to say is the Steelers always love to play down to their competition. Luckily for the Raiders starting 1-0, and I think that the Steelers not exactly playing down to their competition Competition, they probably see the Raiders coming in as somewhat of an equal, a team that they have to be well prepared for. Let's stay in the morning slate. Let's talk about the Saints and Panthers. Uh, currently, the Saints are three and a half point favorites. Uh, they're dealing with a lot of injuries themselves. Uh, Marcus Davenport, one of their pass rushers, dealing with a shoulder injury. Starting center go down, Eric McCoy. Uh, Cesar Rees, last year's first round pick, is going to be playing center for them. They also have potentially Marshawn Lattimore is going to miss this game as well. So another hit. So as good as last week was for them, blowing out the Packers 38 to 3, five passing touchdowns for Jameis, they didn't come out of it unscathed and the Panthers on their side of things they had a victory against the Jets but I don't think they looked that good in that victory it was still a relatively close game it finished within one score the Jets are a bad team I would have liked to have seen a little bit more from the Panthers in that game yes Sam Darnold played better but I, I do think it's a little deceptive now it's a huge plus to him if Marshawn Lattimore misses this game if Davenport misses this game but I think the Saints defense is still a good defense and I think that that's going to be a problem for Sam Darnold I'm picking the Saints to win my joke around the Carolina Panthers is like, can't remember. I might've been Lendell White. I'm not sure back in the 2000s, but he had a, a quote about, if you need one yard, I'll get you three. If you need five yards, I'll get you three. The Panthers offense will give you 21 points. If you <laughs> if you allow more than 21 points, you're going to lose. If you allow less than 21 points, you're going to win. They will give you 21 points, whether you need 28 or 14 to win. So the Panthers will probably score 21 points. Can the Saints generate enough? offense to beat that Carolina Panthers team? That's a great question. I don't know what to make of the Saints after the first game because it was obviously so excellent for them. Jameis, surprisingly, it was like Deontay Harris and Chris Hogan who were scoring touchdowns for the Saints and Marquez Callaway, the guy we thought was going to be the number one receiver, was basically a non-factor against the Packers. And part of that might have been going up against Jair Alexander, but I don't really know. And the Saints are going to be an interesting team. So Alvin Kamara, 
versus Christian McCaffrey is the flashy matchup. And I want to just say this is going to be just fun to watch. It's aesthetically pleasing football. It's the reason that this is one of those watchable games in the morning window. I hope that the Red Zone channel shows it a bunch. But I will take the New Orleans Saints to win against the Carolina Panthers. I think Carolina is iffy not to say the saints are wowing anyone away this season now they've just smacked the green bay packers but i don't think any like with the raiders i don't think anyone's like the saints are a super bowl contender now i think people kind of look at that and they're like yeah this was a weird win for the saints so i like new orleans in this one although christian mccaffrey is probably going to have a big day like he always does because he's christian mccaffrey and he's used on like 55 percent of their plays at this point so saints but closer than people think. I I don't remember what the spread is. I'm guessing it's probably like three or four points. Three and a half. uh, I think it's as high as five going in. One thing that does concern me is the Saints travel week. Fort Worth to Jacksonville, back to Fort Worth, and then to Carolina. So they haven't officially had a home game. Well, they've officially had a home game, but they haven't really had a home game. Their home game was in Jacksonville last weekend. Hey, they played like they were in the Superdome, but still, it it doesn't really count. (laughs) They don't have to worry about Drew Brees not being able to play in outdoor stadiums anymore. It's, it's no longer a concern. There was something crazy that Jameis and one of his throws last week had more air yards than Drew Brees has. I want to say something like either his career or at least the last 10 years. But yeah. I, that tells you like, and this is why I was telling people don't sleep on the Saints this year is that Jameis this year might be better than last year's version of Drew Brees. He, j- he just has more in his back pocket. There was a reason that Jameis had that first round, first overall pick pedigree. And it's because the talent has always been there. That's not been the issue with Jameis. It's been the decision-making. And whether it's LASIK, new lease on life, some of these weird training programs, he seems to be locked in this year. He looks better. He looks thinner. He looks ready to be an NFL quarterback. One of the most unique things I I notice about Jameis or have seen from Jameis, did you know that he mentioned he didn't even know how to read defenses as of a few years ago while he was in the pros? (laughs) He admitted to that not knowing how to read defenses. The guy's essentially been winging it his whole life. How do you wing it and become an NFL quarterback? Well, also winning the Heisman as a freshman for the first time in 50 years or, you know, getting to be the number one pick. It's it's true. Winning a national championship at Florida State. Like it's remarkable just how talented Jameis Winston is. And I had said it last year. I think Jameis is better than Drew Brees right now, which is a testament to just Drew Brees, along with 11 broken ribs, a torn ligament in his ankle, all that stuff that was going on there. But I understood why the Saints didn't make the switch. This is a hugely emotional emotional decision. This is the final year of a championship window built around Drew Brees. He's the greatest athlete in the history of New Orleans. This is a hugely emotional decision more than anything else. It's the same reason the Broncos put Peyton Manning in for that playoff run when Brock Osweiler was playing quarterback when he was hurt. Now, did the Broncos get away with it? Absolutely. And the Saints didn't because Tom Brady happened. But still, it was an emotional decision and I get why they didn't do it. But even if Jameis is isn't a top 20 quarterback if he's not a top 15 quarterback wherever he is at this point it's still solid enough with a great Saints defense and Alvin Kamara and potentially Michael Thomas to at least get you to nine wins at the very least it can get you to nine wins What week one really showed was just the pure upside of this team, that they can compete with anyone. They're a problem matchup for whoever you are. I don't care if you're the Bucs. A lot of people try to tell me the Bucs were going undefeated in division. No, they're probably going to split that series with the Saints. I'm telling you right now that that's going to happen. Okay, let's go back into the afternoon slate. Big game, uh, especially for one of these teams. The Titans are going into Seattle. Uh, The Titans, uh, one of the bigger blowouts, one of the bigger shocks of the weekend. Arizona just absolutely decimated them. Their defense showed no signs of improvement from last year. And uh, everyone was telling me the Titans defense is going to be much improved. Come on, we got pieces of free agency we made some draft picks. I didn't see it. It, it. it looked just as bad as last year. They they couldn't stop a nosebleed, whether it was the ground game or Kyler Murray 
There was no stopping the Arizona Cardinals. Meanwhile, Seattle almost equaled the success of the Cardinals against the Colts. Russell Wilson, four passing touchdowns on the day, just throwing absolute bombs to Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf. Russell Wilson, best deep ball thrower in the league, just the way it just kind of hangs up there. And when he throws in there, you almost feel like the receiver is just going to come down with it. Once again, he might be giving you a reason for optimism with those MVP votes. We were talking about it last week, Kyle. But yeah, Russell Wilson looked great. The Titans did not. Currently, this line is sitting at six and a half points in favor of Seattle. So almost a touchdown. I I want to say that seems a little high for me. That gives me a lot of cause for pause. But this is going to be Seattle's first game with the 12s back in the stadium. That is a big factor to consider because last year, not having that home field advantage, not having that big booming Seattle attendance, I definitely do think may have slowed the Seahawks down a little bit. That's no longer a problem this year. So ah, who do I want to pick? Who do I want to pick? I almost want to pick the Titans because I'm like bounce back week. Come on. You you just got embarrassed last week against the Cardinals. You know, I'm going to do it. I'm going to pick the Titans in an upset outright in Seattle. Wow. I commend you for your cojones in making this prediction. So I'll just Gotta get it cojones. out of the way. Gotta have the gunness. Absolutely. Just to get it out of the way, I've got Seattle this week winning and covering the spread. My buddy over at Beer Life Sports, Razor Rosenthal, says take Russell Wilson, Lockett, and DK Metcalf in your daily fantasy leagues uh, this week. But to the point about the game itself, there were two teams that I felt like totally changed their defense over the offseason. And through both of them, I said they have a new defense, but it doesn't mean they have a good defense. Just because you have new names doesn't make you a great team. And it was Cleveland and it was the Titans and I walk away from week one feeling great about Cleveland and awful about the Titans defense and so Tennessee has names that you recognize Jeffrey Simons has been awesome across the past couple of years Harold Landry Bud Dupree is now rushing off the edge for them they gave him like 80 million dollars I think so that could be a poor contract down the line but the Titans secondary is pretty depleted Kevin Byard is not the player he once was and he's supposed to be the anchor of a really young defense apparently Janoris Jenkins is on the Titans now I found that out over the weekend so good for Janoris Jenkins that he's still hanging around there but I think that (laughs) your point on the 12s actually is funny because you realize that without the 12s they lose home games to Colt McCoy and Alfred Morris against the Giants which is a thing that happened last year I can never get over the fact they lost to Colt McCoy and Alfred Morris last year but still who Colt McCoy is currently playing for uh Cardinals I do know that that I produce a Cardinals podcast and that might be the only reason why I know that is because I I know Colt McCoy is the backup for the Cardinals (laughs) Alfred Morris I think just got cut by someone I think he's out of the league now but uh he was out of the league for like two years they just signed him and he scored two touchdowns against the Seahawks give it a couple more Niners injuries and then I I could see him have it (laughs) yeah I mean the Ravens are assembling the 2015 Pro Bowl team in their running back room so maybe just throw Alfred Morris in there too but Seattle for the win in this one Seattle's defense is better than we give it credit for and the reason is just because they have those two anchors being Bobby Wagner and Jamal Adams who are probably the two best at their positions I think Buda Baker probably has them at the safety position but Jamal Adams is right there if not one then two or three and so I think those anchors instantly are going to make you not terrible at defense I think LJ Collier is still out for the Seahawks which is a tough break Jordan Brooks has been been okay for Seattle since they drafted him in 2020. But other than that, Seattle's defense is good enough, given that it looks like Russell Wilson is going to have another one of these arcs where he has 10 great weeks and then just falls off towards the back end of the season. So the offense is going to be in the top seven this year. I think top seven offense against bottom seven defense is never a great combination. So I'll take Seattle and the points in this one, as I said off the top. If you're the Titans' bright spot, you don't have to see Chandler Jones this week. As Taylor Luan said, uh, I got my ass kicked on Twitter. Very appropriate as five sacks. A hell of a day there by Chandler Jones. Definitely earning his money there. Apparently, the uh, Seahawks almost doubled their play actions from last year. So Shane Waldron's definitely had a positive effect on the Seattle Seahawks offense. And I I think another thing that kind of has me down on the Titans, appropriate, 
Todd Downing, the fact that he didn't really utilize all these pieces, all these elite tier talents that they have on the Titans offense in a positive way. I said that that was going to be the biggest thing that gave me kind of concerns for the Titans going into the year. And sure enough, week one, uh, it doesn't look pretty. They didn't, they didn't look like a cohesive offense in any way. I, I guess I'm just looking more so from the pride element of the Titans. I said this going back to when we first started the podcast. When you think they're down, when you think they're going to lose, that's the week to pick the Titans because they always go against our nature. There was this one time, so we were doing the pick very early on in our first like season of doing this. I swear every time I picked them to lose, they would win. Every time I picked them to win, they would lose. So if you're besides me, you probably actually are in the right to pick them to lose because I picked them to win. So I guess that's just kind of how the nature of it goes. <laughs> During that magical season where the Titans made that miraculous run to the AFC championship, I said when they were two and three that the Titans would make it to the playoffs if they put Ryan Tannehill in. And then the next week, Mariota got benched for Tannehill and they made the playoffs and then went to the AFC championship. And ever since that moment, I've been dead wrong about the Titans. I was, it's one of the most right I've ever been. And then I just haven't gotten anything right about the Titans since. I, I passed on Derrick Henry for Michael Thomas in fantasy because I thought he would decline. He had a 2000 yard season. I wouldn't have extended Tannehill fourth in the league in QBR. Said they wouldn't make the playoffs made the playoffs, did lose to Baltimore. So I felt I did pick that one right. Thought they would be all right this year and Derrick Henry would be great. He was terrible. I picked him in fantasy at number four this year because I wasn't making the same mistake twice and he was terrible in week one. So I've been just dead wrong about the Titans ever since. So fittingly, the Titans are probably going to win this week and we can just scream Titan up at our TVs over and over because even if this does change, I'll still be rooting for the Titans because they're just so lovable. Everything about the Titans is lovable. <laughs> Tied it up. Okay, let's go to the big game of the weekend here. The Chiefs and the Ravens. So obviously the big storyline here is Lamar Jackson versus Patrick Mahomes, the two young guns, the two former MVPs going at it. Mahomes currently has a commanding lead in this rivalry so far as he is 3-0 and heading into their fourth matchup against each other. Some bad Lamar stats, 53% completion percentage against Kansas City and averages 170 yards passing against them. Of course, we know that that's not necessarily Lamar's strong suit, but in this type of matchup, in this type of game, you got to be prepared to put up like some big time points, big time passing production. And I don't think Lamar once again, is going to be up for the challenge because on the other side of the football, the Ravens defense looked horrible against the Raiders. They couldn't cover anyone. I, I think that Marcus Peters injury is definitely looming large over their season right now. And if you can't generate a pass rush without blitzing, then that allows Patrick Mahomes to just feed, go ahead, Travis Kelsey, Tyree Kill. Yes, Marlon Humphreys could do a decent job on Tyree Kill, but still, who's covering Kelsey? I, I think it's going to be up to the second wide receiver on the Chiefs, whether that's uh, Miko Hardman or Robinson, Byron Pringle, someone out there has to step up. But if there's a quarterback that I'm confident could find those open matchups while being able to sit comfortably in the pocket, that's going to be Patrick Mahomes. I, I think that the Chiefs moved to 4 0 in this uh, matchup of Lamar and Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, I, I want one of them to come in the playoffs now. I've been waiting years and years for the Mahomes and Lamar playoff matchup, and we've still been deprived of it. The worst one being the Titans. We just talked about them. The Titans pulled the greatest upset of the last 10 years in the playoffs and deprived us of Mahomes versus Lamar. Ugh, that one was rough. So fun fact going into this game, Patrick Mahomes has never lost a football game in September in his NFL career. He is 10-0 and in September, and he goes up against Lamar. Lamar Jackson, who <laughs> the Ravens are, were so injured that they ended up causing injuries to the Raiders just by being around the Baltimore Ravens. The Raiders lost like four players to injuries on their defense. <laughs> and so Baltimore is just so unlucky with the injuries. And despite all of it, I think it doesn't matter because of how good Lamar Jackson is. Like his offensive line isn't as good as it once was. Obviously losing Orlando Brown and replacing him with Alejandro Villanueva, who was getting clowned on the internet for uh, his terrible performance on Monday Night Football is never great. So I think Lamar is going to be okay, especially against like you said, it was a great pass rush night for the Raiders. The Chiefs don't quite have that pass rush, so I think Lamar is going to have time in the pocket, but I think the biggest key for Baltimore is just don't be afraid for Lamar to break off a run into the secondary. If Lamar gets past the first 
group, the Chiefs are going to have no chance bringing him down. Like they're, they've got nobody in the secondary with speed. Lamar Jackson can outrun elite athletes himself. So don't be afraid to let Lamar Jackson work that way. And I think Baltimore is going to stand a chance. You're not going to find me picking against Kansas City, though. That, that would be quite idiotic, uh, considering just like you said, just how fast they can score points. I will say, because we the, the Browns are playing the Texans this week, so it's not really an important game. I have never been more more impressed by a corner who allowed 190 receiving yards as I was for Denzel Ward against Tyree Kill. Like he did a great job guarding Tyree Kill. And uh, I think the the 75 yard bomb, he was being guarded by John Johnson. So that technically wasn't Denzel Ward's fault, but even for allowing a hundred yards by Denzel Ward, I thought he still did a great job guarding Tyree Kill. And maybe Marlon Humphrey can do the same. When we did our preseason picks, Marlon Humphrey was one of those guys that I said, you know, he could be a sneaky defensive player of the year guy because he's the best player on what could be the best defensive unit Mm -hmm. um so maybe this is marlon humphrey's coming out party where he he locks down tyree kill and the ravens now just have to focus on that other hall of fame wide receiver of travis kelsey who can just catch passes even when he's not open so kansas city just because of how overpowering their offense can be but there are paths to victory for baltimore i will say and it it comes from picking apart that Kansas City Chiefs defense and maybe extends to Marlon Humphrey. But even if Tyreek Hill goes berserk on Marlon Humphrey, you can still find a way to win the game. I said it last week. I I just think Travis Kelsey is always open. I I don't think he's ever truly covered. He always just finds a way. Like just when I think they're doing a great job on him, he finds him. A little 10 yard, third and 10, check down, whatever. The guy's fantastic. I know Niners faithful don't like to hear this, but yeah, he, he's the best tight end. In fact, now Darren Waller is kind of in that conversation. But yeah. of course, but Darren still, Waller just even, has to get peppered with targets uh, 20 times in a game. <laughs> even Kittle and Kelsey are the two that we look up and say they're always open, though. Like Kittle kind of does the same types of things. Waller to a certain extent, but Waller's more a finesse guy than those two. Those two just run dudes over and no one can tackle them. Yeah, it, it's really just comes down to this argument with Kittle he's the best overall tight end in terms of blocking as well like his ability to be dynamic in the run and pass blocking game he loves it I mean obviously there's that great image of him laughing as he rolled over a Atlanta Falcons player and he actually had a great block this past weekend uh that I have to still source that clip for my Niners page there okay well hey that rounds out the weekend so we'll see like I said only got a one game lead on you heading into this one. Can you pass me? That's going to be the interesting thing. I think we are actually pretty similar on all the matchups though, right? So let's see, what is the only well, one we got disagreed the on? This week, at least. We have the Titans. Okay, so that one is the opportunity to tie or a two-game lead. I'm rolling with Dallas this week and you are going with the Chargers. So that's a, that's a split. Between okay. Us. So we have opportunity. So you can pass me this week. We'll see how that breaks down. Shits and giggles here, closing the show. Just give me some quick picks here. Nebraska, Oklahoma, Oklahoma by 56, Texas A&M versus the university of New Mexico. <laughs> 30 uh... points spread. <laughs> Let's say New Mexico covers. I'm going to, I'm going to rep the mountain West here. Shout out to the mountain best conference better than the PAC 12, but I'll take them to cover. Texas A&M has looked pretty shaky in the early going here. I guess it's just the pessimism of my hometown, Albuquerque university of New Mexico. Actually, I shouldn't even say Maya proud Aggie here. Alma mater guns up. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know who are, who are we getting blown out by this weekend. I think yeah. we don't have to play Alabama. I think our the worst game that New Mexico State has to face is South Carolina this year. So we got to get blown out <laughs> by 50 by the Gamecocks rather than 80 by the Crimson Tide. So South Carolina is at least one of those where you could theoretically pull an upset because South Carolina no. is really bad this year. This comes from a man who has not seen enough New Mexico State University football. This is really what it comes down to. <laughs> No, that was not to say your team is good. That's just to say South Carolina sucks this year. I think Frank Beamer's son is now their coach. Listen, if that happened, eh, it's not like Las Cruces in Mexico has any more reasons to get drunk. It, you know, I'm just saying it, it's just like three bars. Man, my college three bars is sad in the right. city. Man. My college down is turning sad right now. This is why you moved to Austin. <laughs> all right that does it slump busters let us know what you think about our week two picks leave us a subscription leave a five-star review like this video comment below all that good stuff that helps the channel grow help the channel breathe check out our partner kmancoffeeco.com come on don't be a chump use promo code slump and save yourself some money on some delicious cold brew coffee from kmancoffeeco.com juju talk sports kyle ledbetter stay safe happy and healthy and we'll see you next time